So we're going to get ready this morning to continue our series, Jesus Volume 1. Has anybody been enjoying this talk on Jesus? I hope for you that it's been life-giving and that you've been able to see Jesus a little bit more clearly. Um, and uh, it's my heart for you that not only would you be a follower of Jesus, but you would be somebody who knows him that knows about him, that knows of him, and knows him internally, that he's in your heart, and you understand why he came, why he did what he did. Why did he say that? That's a weird thing to say. Why would he say that? Why did he address that like that? Jesus doesn't just do things. Jesus does everything for a reason, and, uh, and I want for you to be able to see clearly why Jesus does these things. So we started the series um, uh, a couple weeks ago when we're looking through the book of John, and, and in John 1, um, uh, John declares that Jesus is God, that he was the word in the beginning, that he's always been. He makes it clear Jesus isn't just some man. He is, in, he is, in fact, God. He is God. And that's important for you and I to know that Jesus just isn't some other guy that had good principles. It's important that we know that he is the Son of God, that he is God. I think it's also important for you and I to know that he's man, right? Like we talked about that, that he was a dude. He was a construction worker. He was a regular guy. He didn't, Austin, we have this slide, he didn't look like this. Um, he didn't look like this. He looked like this. Come on, let's go to the next one. He looks like this. I'm going to go quick, Austin. He looked like that right there. That's Jesus. Um, so next time you pray, um, just let that be burned into your head. That's an awkward image, though. Like the 3D rendering, just it looks weird. Every time I put it on the screen, you guys look at me like, don't do it again. Don't put that. <laughs> like, <laughs> not my Jesus, right? That is more accurately what Jesus would have would have looked like, and, and it's important that we know that he was man so that we understand he gets it, like he, he gets it, right? Like he understands what it's like to go through life. He knows what it's like to pay bills. He knows what it's like to, to wake up in the morning and maybe not be in love with your line of work because one day I'm going to be in ministry. One day I'm going to get a promotion and I'm going to be the most famous person. I got dreams in my heart, but right now I'm building sheds. Right now, I'm building doors. Right now, I'm building houses. One day, though, I'm going to be somebody. This is a house that Jesus maybe could have built, a type of that house in Jerusalem. Uh, 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 but I got a sermon on the mount prepared. I've been writing messages. People just don't know. I'm going to be famous one day. And uh, Jesus knows what it's like. Um, it's important that we know that Jesus was Messiah. John declares that, that he has come to save the world, that he is our savior, he's our avenger, he's our hero. If he came just to teach us about God, then that does nothing for us than give us knowledge. The fact that he came to save us means that we have the ability to be children of God and receive a new blessing. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning. And as John chapter 3 dives into a little bit more of how that, that actually works. And then, and then last week we talked about John chapter 2 and Jesus' first miracle, turning water to wine. And how he can take the, the ordinary things in your life, the water, the basic things, the Monday through Friday, the raising a child, the raising two, the raising three, the, the average things in your life. And when he gets into the picture, he takes ordinary and makes it extraordinary. He makes new wine out of, out of water, a basic element. We talked about how Jesus came and he flipped the temples, uh, flipped, flipped the, the tables inside of the temple. He flipped over the money changers. They were selling doves and, and oxen and, and uh, items for people to sacrifice to God to, to appease their sins. And Jesus is like, whoa, you've got it wrong. And he's angry. He's frustrated. And he declares, I'm going to destroy this temple. Whoa. <laughs> like, don't do that. Like, too intense, Jesus. Jesus was intense. He was intense because he wanted you to know this isn't the way anymore. The temple, this isn't the system that I want. I'm going to break this system and I'm going to reestablish this system. And in three days, I'll rebuild it. And we know that Jesus died and three days later, he rose again. And now we go to Jesus and not through a temple and a priest to have our sins forgiven, to be made right with God. We get to go straight to Jesus. So he is the, the new temple. And then he closes John, John, closes John 2 with, with saying that Jesus wanted to trust himself to men, but Jesus needs no one to tell him what's in the heart of men, for he already knows that God sees the deepest, darkest parts of your story. He sees the, the hard things. He sees the ugly things. He sees the things that you and I dress up with makeup and we put on layers to hide things. He sees what's in there. You can't mask it with God. And God is looking for people that he can trust all of himself to. He wants to give away all of it. He wants to give you full access to all that he is. But he knows what's in our hearts. And we talked about maybe what are the things that we're holding back from God? You know, Keyshawn talked about it in worship this morning. She talked about, uh, I won't relent until you have it all. I won't, I won't stop until, I, until you can have all of me and not just part of me. 
And Jesus wants all of you because Jesus gives all of him. Jesus requires all of you because he required of himself to give all of himself to you. Okay, and, and what kind of church could we be if we walked in all of God's trust? So what we want to do is we want to continue this series, and we're going to move on to John chapter 3. It's the most quoted um, scripture in, in all of history. Uh, John 3.16 is bumper stickers, t-shirts, tattoos, all sorts of things. And uh, John 3.16 has been shared as the epitome of the gospel summed up. And what I want to do is I think sometimes we read John 3.16, and we just think that's the whole gospel. Like, that's the whole book. That's the whole thing. It's just John 3.16. That's the Bible. Like, there's more to it. Um, whenever you read scripture, you need to read the Bible. The happened, what was said before it, and what was said after it, to fully understand what's being said, because you could just read that, and it just be a statement that you can apply your own definition and your own meaning to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It's wonderful. And some of us, I think, if we're honest, like, I don't even really know what that means. So what I want to do today is my best to preach the first half of John chapter 3, verses 1 um, through 21, and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll save the rest for another day, but we'll start there. A couple things before we move on. Uh, Dream Team, uh, this weekend is Friendsgiving. We're super excited to have you guys out. If you haven't, um, have you haven't made, cleared your calendar, clear it this uh, this. Uh, Saturday is Friendsgiving. There's going to be uh, an insane football game that's getting ready to go down. So even if you're not on the Dream Team, get the address. And if you find yourself there and you want to be on my team and you got a decent 40, um, you can be on my team. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. So Friendsgiving is happening this weekend. Next Steps will be right after service. We're doing 201 this morning. Next Steps is where we, we bring you through the Imagine Church process and, and let you know about who we are. And this is 201, my favorite. And today we get to do your disc personality test. We're going to do your spiritual gifts to test uh, straight strengths assessment and uh, and let you get to know you a little bit today because if you're going to find out why God wants you on this earth you got to find out who God made you on this earth you know what I mean you got to know who you are to find out what you're supposed to do with life and uh, so that's going to happen right after service I encourage you come on over come on over uh, Lord would you just give me the words this morning I just pray it's all of you and none of me um, we love you Lord we thank you Jesus that you've given us um, actually what I consider a beautiful day outside it's cool it's it's sweater weather this is my favorite time so Lord I just thank you Lord that your your face is here that your face and your countenance are, are looking on us and Lord we just ask you to speak to us we love you we give you praise we give you glory and it's in Jesus name we pray amen have you ever had to go to the store to buy something for somebody um, and it's awkward? Has anybody ever had this happen to them before? You gotta go to the store and you gotta buy stuff or maybe it's even for you but it's an awkward purchase. How many of you remember pre-self checkout days? Back in the day when you couldn't go to the self checkout to buy certain items for your wife um, you know what I mean? Or, or for whoever, and you're checking out, it's like, it's not for me. It's not for me. You know, like you, back in the day when you didn't have self-checkout, um, when Ireland was little, uh, when Ireland was little, she had a, she had a bathroom issue. And, uh, she had a bathroom issue where she could, <laughs> Number two was hard, you know, number two was hard for her. And, uh, and my wife was like, I know what we need. I know what we need. We need, <laughs> we need these little pills. Um, that, uh, that you insert, not through the mouth. And, uh, and when you put them in, stuff comes out. And I'm like, wait a second. That's how, that's not how it works. Like, that is not how it works. Nothing's supposed to, that's not how it works. And, uh, and, uh, so I had to go to the store and, uh, um, I had to buy, I had to buy suppositories. Okay. And, uh, when there's no self-checkout, you know, seven years ago, when there was no, no self-checkout at every store that they have now, and, you know, Amazon Prime wasn't really a thing just yet. You couldn't just get it the same day. You had to go to the store to buy awkward things. And I remember coming up to the, to the register, and, like, I'm holding, I'm holding the suppositories like this. Like, I'm, like, hiding it in line because there's a long line, and you're just like, eh, nothing's in my hand. And you're just like, swipe it, swipe it, scan it, scan it, shut up. Don't say anything. And I'm like, oh. So I got up and, and, and she scans it and she looks at me. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not for me. It's not for me. It's not for me. It's for my baby. It's just not for me. And uh, if you've ever had to buy anything that makes you feel awkward, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not for me. I don't want to be here right now. Why couldn't my wife have done this? Okay, it's less awkward for my wife to buy some positive. Is it less awkward? I don't know. 
I don't know. I remember my dad would get really uncomfortable whenever my sister turned a teenager, and uh, he had to go to the store to buy stuff for my little sister, and he'd be so mad. Now I know. Now I know. It's awkward. People look at you judgingly. It's terrible. It's terrible. That's why you go to Walmart at 1 o'clock in the morning. Nobody judges anybody at 1 o'clock in the morning at Walmart. It's a judge-free zone. I love Walmart after dark. Um, um, in, in our story, in our story in John chapter 3, I'm about to read a little bit of scripture. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee, Nicodemus is a religious man, he's a preacher, and he's somebody that belongs to the Pharisee sect. There's a section of, of religious leaders called the Pharisees, there's the Sadducees, there's a whole bunch of C's, um, but we're going to focus on Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, is, uh, Nicodemus is a Pharisee, he's a teacher of the old covenant, the old law. He has lived and died by the temple that Jesus just said, I'm going to rip down and destroy. He would have worked at the temple where Jesus came in and threw over the money. Uh, Nicodemus was probably getting a little bit of coin in his pocket over what was happening. And then Jesus makes this statement at the end of, 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 the, of the book of John chapter 2 that says, I know what's in their hearts. And they can't be trusted. So Nicodemus, Nicodemus is a Pharisee who is having a problem with his status right now because he's watching Jesus. And even though everybody that's in his group dislikes Jesus and disapproves of what he's doing, Nicodemus kind of likes Jesus. You know, like he just, he's a, he's a Dolphins fan that kind of likes the Patriots. You know what I mean? Like he's rooting for the other team secretly in his heart. He's rooting for the other team. And, and the Bible says um, in John chapter three, that Nicodemus asked for a meeting at night with Jesus, which is to say, I don't want anybody to see what I'm purchasing right now. I don't want anybody to see the meeting that's it's awkward. I don't want anybody to know the conversation that we're about to have. And just what it says in John 3, verse 1. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So he was a high-seated Pharisaical preacher. He was high in the rankings. And it says that uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. This man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know. What is it? We know. Come on. How, if you've read any of scripture, you know the Pharisees didn't act like they knew nothing. You're crazy. You're a liar. You're a heretic. You're not the son of God. You're full of devils. That's why you can cast out devils. They hated Jesus. It says, we know. We know that you are a teacher that's came from God. For no one can do these signs that you have done unless God is with you. Nicodemus comes at night, and the word that he used in, in, at night is, is a word that they used for the second watch, which would have been sometime after midnight. It, was, it wasn't the third watch. Third watch is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It was in the second watch, so it was sometime between midnight to 3 o'clock in the morning. He comes in the middle of the night because no upstanding Jew, no religious leader would have been out after dark. You would not have gone out. So he knows no one's going to see me go talk to Jesus if I go at night. There was no electricity. I want you to get the picture. This would have been a candlelight meeting between Nicodemus and Jesus, a leader of the people that, that are against Jesus and Jesus himself. And Jesus does this crazy thing. And I think when you read scripture, you really have to read all of it and, and ponder. That's why I say you got to muse. You got to get, you got to get with it and, and understand what's happening here. Uh, that he came to Jesus by night. Here's what I want you to know. Jesus will meet you whenever you're ready. Jesus will meet you wherever and whenever you're ready. Wherever and whenever you're ready to start your journey with him, whether it's in the middle of the day when everybody's watching or whether it's in the middle of the night, in your darkest hour, in your darkest moment, when nobody's watching and you know the content of your heart and where you're going and how you feel about life, Jesus will meet you right there. Jesus will meet you right where you are. How many of us can be thankful for this? Or maybe you can be thankful moving forward from today that even at your darkest, even at your worst, even in secret, you can come to Jesus and he will take you right there. He doesn't say, oh, no, 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 no. Go back, tell Caiaphas to set up an appointment with Matthew, my, uh, my tax collector, and uh, book an appointment through Mary, and uh, then I'll meet with you in a public temple for all to see. Why? What did we just read? Jesus doesn't care about what's happening on the outside. Jesus cares about what's happening on the inside. And so he comes by night to Jesus, and Jesus, it's amazing, and you can overlook it. Jesus takes the meeting. 
Jesus will take the meeting that you give him. Whenever you're ready, whenever you want to start this journey, whenever you're ready with your questions, Jesus is ready and willing to come meet with you. And he doesn't care what you look like. He just wants you when you're, when you're, when you're ready. Um, have, you ever, have you ever heard somebody say something crazy and you just kind of look at them like somebody says something along and it's like, oh. I mean, you seen any like the gifs or memes that are going around with like the cat and the two women, like it's the best of all time. And like every time you look at the cat, it's like you're seeing him for the first time all over again. You're like, oh, he did it again. Like he did it again. Like these girls are saying something crazy. And then he's looking at them like, oh, uh, you know what I mean? Like it's just the best. So people say crazy things. I love when people say crazy things because I love watching a crowd react to when people say crazy things. My wife says a lot of crazy things. Um, and uh, we celebrated our 11th wedding anniversary last night, so um, give it up for us. We made it 11 years. I had a conversation with her. I'm like, the average marriage in America is like less than two years. I'm like, we're at 11. What, when are we going to just, when are we gonna, how long are we going to keep this up? You know what I mean? Like, we've had an exit ready this whole time, and we just keep coming back for more, right, baby? I love you. I love you. 11 years married to the best woman in the world. My wife says crazy things, though, now that I've fluffed her up a little bit. She says crazy things. Um, we were youth pastors for several years, and we would get up on stage every Sunday night, and, and we would get ready to do our host talk, where we'd welcome the teenagers, we'd have a crazy game plan, you know, and, and we'd go back and forth and talk about crazy stuff to welcome them all in, and, uh, and uh, my, I used to have rules, and I had rules, and uh, I have rules, I have four rules that the students had to follow, or we call them the four respects, four things we're going to ask you to respect, um, respect worship, don't be moving around. Don't be, you know, talking loud. If you got to talk, go outside. Um, respect the person with the microphone. So if somebody's talking, you're not. you got to explain these things to teenagers. Thank God I'm a lead pastor now, and I don't have to tell you guys. Don't hit somebody during service, okay? Don't play the circle game right now, okay? Let's not do that. You know, respect the person with the mic. Um, and and one, of our, one of our rules was respect the ladies, okay? And I said this every Sunday night. Fellas! Respect my ladies, okay? And I would say this, if you're thirsty, there's a water fountain in the lobby. That's what I would say. If you're thirsty, we got a snack bar, okay? Like, we can hook you up. Leave my girls alone. Let them worship Jesus without you staring at them. You know, <laughs> Jovan, what was our conversation at the wedding? You know, worship, and you learn how to have a peripheral vision during worship because you're worship next to the spine girl. Like, ah! You know, you're worshiping like, is he looking at me? You know, that was youth group days, you know what I mean? That's what they're doing. They're worshiping, but they're worshiping. You know what I mean? Like, they're worshiping two different things at the same time, the fellas. So we tell them, respect the ladies. Leave my ladies alone. Let them worship in a, in a distraction-free environment. Although, come on, the ladies love them. I'm going to be honest with you. Girls like, ah! Anyways, and my wife goes, she always plays off of me. And she goes, I'm like, respect the ladies. There's, there's a water fountain in the lobby. And Tiny grabs the mic, and I never know what she's going to say. She goes, yeah! This ain't no hookah bar. <laughs> I just looked at her. <laughs> what? My wife's innocent, okay? She's innocent. She's an innocent little thing, okay? Homeschooled Pentecostal Cuban family, okay? Like, she didn't know what the world looked like until she turned 18, you know what I mean? Like, she's like, yeah! This ain't no hookah bar. And I, like, baby, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you know what you're saying right now. <laughs> you're right. It's not a hookah bar. But I'm not sure how a hookah bar applies to this scenario. And I'm like, what? And the kids are dying laughing. And she's like, yeah, that's where people go to hook up at the hookah bar. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not, that is not why they go to the hookah bar. Like, what, what are we even saying right now? Edit it out of the podcast. Edit it out of the podcast. People say crazy things and then people respond in like crazy ways like, oh my gosh, what did my wife just say in front of teenagers? What is going on right now? And in John 3, Jesus is getting ready and you have to understand, he's getting ready to make a crazy statement to, that's going to make Nicodemus do a double take. Jesus is about, is about to drop some theology on Nicodemus that's going to revolutionize the Jewish faith and introduce Christianity. Jesus is getting ready to say something that has never been said before. He's going to introduce a concept that if you've been in the faith circle for a minute, you've probably heard this a million times. 
And Jesus in John chapter 3, it says, Jesus answered him. I want to go back and I just want to point out that, that Nicodemus did not ask a question. He made a statement. You're a man of God. We can all see that. And it says, and, and immediately after, Jesus answered him. Jesus, Nicodemus didn't ask a question. Like Jesus is answering questions nobody's asking. That's the statement right there. You got questions you're not asking. And Jesus is ready to answer the questions you're not asking. Come on, the weight of the response that you'll get from God is determined in the value of the questions that you begin to ask them. That's another message. Put that in my notes. Somebody write that down. Well, Jesus answered him. Truly, truly, which is to just put crazy emphasis on what I'm about to say. He's going, listen to me right now, Nicodemus. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is like Tanya with the hookah bar statement. Nicodemus is like, What? born again and we look at that and Tanya was like you need to like breathe in between the words born and again she's like his Christian's just like born again born again like it's one word born again are you born again and like we just go into our own place but like, are you born again <laughs> what that's a crazy concept and like I think in Christian circles we've minimized the idea of being born again just down to do you love Jesus like do you, do you think he's cool have you read your bible being born again is a crazy concept it's actually a, a, a revolutionary concept that is entirely everything Jesus came to make happen for you and me, to allow us to be born again. And I love, I love that Nicodemus is just like a normal, regular dude because Nicodemus is like me. He's like the D plus student sitting in the back and he's like, <sighs> can you repeat the question? <laughs> can you can you say that one more time? I'm putting that in my <sighs> I misheard what you just said. I misheard what you just said. <laughs> I love Nicodemus and I was reading it and I thought it was funny and Tiny thought it was dumb. That Nicodemus, his last two letters of his name are US, it's us. Nicodemus is just us. Nicodemus is you and me. Thankfully he is basic like you and me, and he's like, mm. can't skip over what you just said just now because that was crazy. That we're, we need to be what? We need to be born again. Nicodemus, he's you and me. He's us. And Jesus points out this crazy concept. So and Nicodemus responds in verse 4. He says, <clears throat> Jesus, um, let me just rewind that. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he re-enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Like, he's just like, hold up, Jesus. Gosh, you're always, this is why we don't like you. Okay, because you do things like this. What do you mean? Uh, so, my, my mama's old, okay? Like, like, my mama's old right now, and I don't think she can handle, have you seen my head? Like, my God, have you seen my head? She cannot birth me again. And this is how basic it is. Nicodemus is point blank saying, how can, the, when we hear this as Christians, we go, oh, born again. It's born again. No, it's not just born again. Like, it's a crazy idea to be born again. If you've ever watched birth happen, it's a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. Man is about to watch a baby be born. Come on, baby, Oakland. That's what's up. It's gonna change the way you see being born again. You're gonna be like, oh my Jesus. And Jesus said, what? Thank you, Nicodemus, for making him continue to elaborate what's happening here. Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born again? Kids in the background, okay? I didn't read the pretest. I didn't, I didn't study during summer. I came back unprepared for what you were about to say. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his, into his mother's womb and be born? And I had a really funny video that I was going to play, um, but I watched it with my wife and had second thoughts um, because I thought it would be appropriate, but then we watched it and it wasn't appropriate. It just wasn't appropriate. And we were, I was like, ha! Oh, it was a bad, it was a bad video. Anybody ever seen Ace Ventura Pet Detective 2? Remember the scene with the rhino? Uh, where he's in the mechanical rhino, and I want to play it, but he comes out, not, it doesn't show anything, but he comes out naked, and, uh, which is a birth, but anyways, he comes, and he's like, uh, he's coming through, like, the latex rhino butt, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm saying this, and uh, he's coming out of his, and he's coming out, and, and the family pulls up from the safari, and they're like, oh! Look, sweetie, the rhino's giving birth to a baby rhino. And it's basically going, and it's just Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. And a grown man climbs out of a rhino's backside. And, uh, 
And then, like, I am like, covering their kids' eyes. Get in the car! Get in the car! Run! Like, I think in my mind, this is what Nicodemus is picturing. Like, a grown man being born again. Like, oh, my mom's gonna kill me! Like, this is so bad. Everybody has to do this? Everybody? Like, what if your mom's gone to heaven? Like, what do you do then? Do you just pick them up? Like, what do you do? <laughs> you can tell me when I take it too far, but it's okay. Ah. So Jesus is like, oh my gosh, okay, let me, let me take a drink. <laughs> you called this meeting, right? Like, you called this meeting with me. Let me explain myself. So Jesus elaborates. Thankfully, Jesus elaborates. <laughs> uh, can you imagine if we got the context wrong on that? That's just be so bad. That'd be so bad. Jesus answered, truly, truly, again, emphasis, listen to what I'm about to say. I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Crazy strong statement right there. Please digest that for a second. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you neither hear its sound, nor do you know where it comes from or where it goes. So is it with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus is saying, okay, let me in my, the best way I possibly can explain this. You don't see wind, right? But you know it's there. What is, it's impossible to please God. We just came out of a series on fear versus faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. We are saved by faith, not by works. There's an idea of, uh, of you have to make a decision to believe something that's incredibly hard to believe. But Jesus points out a couple critical things in this little passage of scripture. All, all this leads up to John 3.16. So I hope by the time we get to John 3.16, you'll have a greater understanding of why Jesus said what he said. Jesus reveals to us that the birth to be born again, to be born again, born again, to be born again, is to be rebirthed by the Spirit, to be born into a spiritual birth. He says, by water, when a woman has a baby, the water breaks and the baby passes through where water was. So there's a water birth. There is an actual birth that you and I, we have to be born. Come on. Like, we have to be born. But then we need to be born again. We need to be born again. And we're born by the Spirit. It's a spiritual birth, and, and I, I want you to understand this because um, I want you to understand this makes the gospel of Jesus transformational, not just informational. It makes it life-changing, not philosophy-changing. It, it, it literally shifts everything about us. We become a transformed first person and not just an informed person any, anymore. It's a, it's a, it's a trans. Uh, it's a transformed life, not just a better way of doing things. Jesus says, uh, it, it, even if you get this, and you're not, you'll never, you're not going to get all of it unless you're born again. You need to go through the birth of the Spirit because I've come not only to show you how the kingdom of heaven operates, but to to create in you a new being. I've come to make you reborn. I've come to rebirth you. You're going to be born again by the Spirit. Why does that matter? Adam and Eve ruined this for us. When Adam and Eve, in the very beginning of the Bible, committed the first sin, they separated us from the presence of God. They created a dividing wall between you and I having the ability to be filled with the Spirit and to walk with God. They removed the ability for you and I to do that. So when Jesus says, I've come and I'm going to allow you to be born again by the Spirit, Jesus is saying, I'm taking it back. Adam and Eve messed it up, and for thousands of years, people have been living a lustful, greedy, selfish, uh, warring, fighting, uh, uh, rabble-rousing. They've been, they've been saying negative things. There's been deceit. There's been betrayal. For thousands of years, you've only been born of water. And the Bible says that when we're born because of what Adam and Eve did, we're born into sin nature. Complex term. Uh, sin nature simply means you were already born separated from God. You were already born that way. You have no say in it. 
It's an ancestral thing. It's passed down in your lineage from the very beginning in Adam and Eve. Because of their disobedience, you are born in disobedience. So when I'm birthed by water alone, I'm birthed into sin. But Jesus says, no longer is that the only birth you can have. I'm going to rebirth you in the spirit. And my sacrifice is going to make you how God has always designed you to be. You've been missing something. So when you're saved by me, and when you're born again by my spirit, you become what I've always wanted you to be. You become spirit filled, a walking ambassador made and walk, walking and operating in the image of God. I'm transformed. It's not just informed. How many of you know if it stays here and it stays here and it never gets in your spirit, it never gets down into the depths of your DNA and woven into who you are, if it never gets deep inside of you, it'll always just be an, an additive to your life. Oh, well, I go to church and Jesus is good. It's good stuff. It's great, great talks and he says funny things sometimes. You know, it'll just be informational. God hasn't called you to be informed. He's called you to be transformed. God has called you to be filled with his presence, to be a walking miracle worker, to be a walking son and daughter of God who, who walks in authority, who sees signs and wonders happen, who walks in forgiveness, who walks in obedience, who walks in blessing, who walks in favor. When you walk into a room, Jesus walks into a room, not because you were born of water, because you were reborn by spirit. So Jesus makes this crazy statement. You become new. What did he just say? I can't trust man because of what's in their heart, so what am I going to do? I'm going to rebirth them from the inside out. It's not a physical change. That was your first birth. This is a change and a rebirth of what's on the inside. I'm going to rebirth it. You become new from the inside. You're no longer subject to the old you. How many have ever heard of old Christians? I was old saying, I used to be a crazy man. You know, I, back in the day, I was wild. And you're like, well, oh. What's different? I was born again. Jesus saved me. And I, can, man, can we get old school again? Can we get old school and be faithful in our marriages? Can we get old school and not let two years be the national average? Can we be old school and raise our children to know God and to understand God? Can we be old school and teach people right from wrong? Can we be old school and trust God? Can we be old school? Take it back. Let's take it. Let's take it back. Let's take it back. Jesus, I'm taking you back to what it was always supposed to be. Something went wrong. You're no longer subject to that old man. You don't got to be that man anymore. Yeah, I was addicted, but don't let anybody call you addicted anymore. You're set free. You're completely new. Literally, completely new. You were adopted out of a family. This is what's wild. You were adopted out of a family that you used to belong to. And when you accept being born again by Jesus in the blood that he takes pen to paper... And he puts his signature. She's mine now. The contract with hell has been ripped up and thrown into the trash. He's mine now. I'm his brother. My dad is his dad now. Satan, get your hands off. He's no longer in your bloodline anymore. He is now born again into my bloodline. So my blood courses through his veins. Jesus is returning us to God's initial design. And Nicodemus said to him, again, mm -mm. how can these things be? Is Nicodemus' next question. How can these things be? And Jesus says to him, Jesus says to him, I have told you earthly, oh, Jesus, there it is. Are you the teacher? Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Come on, you're a Pharisee. You're a teacher, you're a pastor, and you don't get it. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive my testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I put it in heavenly terms? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, me, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I'm going to read that again. I'm going to read it through the message translation just so it's a little bit more digestible in this moment and then I'll, I'll explain just a little bit of that. As Jesus, Jesus said the same verse in a different translation. It won't be on the screen. So he says, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't even know these basics. Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. 
I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is no secondhand information here, no hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with more questions. If I tell you things that are plain as man, as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you the things you can't see, the things, the things of God? Jesus, in this moment, I believe, is showing exceptional actual patience with Nicodemus and saying, I get it. I get it. This is why you need to be born again. You need evidence. And here's what he's saying. I am the evidence. You started out by saying, Rabbi, you perform signs and wonders. We know you must know God. And he's going, allow the evidence of my life to be all the proof you need. Allow the way I'm about to live my life. Just watch. Just what did he say to his first disciples? Come on, we said it in, in John 1. What did he say to him? Come on. Come. Somebody's whispering and see. Who is it? Is it, is it you, Sarah? Come and see. It's an invitation to come and see. Jesus isn't into you just believing just to believe. He says, come and see. Allow the evidence of his life. This is not hearsay. This is first, I am the son of God. So believe me based on the way I live my life. Watch how I live and I will show you. And he's saying, you've already seen it, Nicodemus. You've already seen the things I do. You've already seen my teachings. You've already seen how I fulfilled scripture. Yet you still choose to keep asking questions because you're looking for an answer that fits your narrative. How often do you and I look to God and we don't like some of the things he's about and some of the things he does and so we modify him to fit our narrative? I don't like that God's against that. I don't like that God calls that sin. I don't like that God said that. I don't like that that's the way he responded. Can I just be honest with you? God doesn't care that you get offended by what he says and does because he's God. He gets to be God. What we know, though, is Jesus comes to say many things men have gotten wrong and misinterpreted, and I'm coming to show you the why behind the what, which is what we're about to get to. So he makes this statement. you got to see the way I live my life. I'm not going to fit your narrative, Nicodemus. I'm not going to fit your narrative, Shad. I know you just want everybody to go to heaven and everybody gets the ticket no matter what they've done. You just want everybody to go because you just so do I. I love everybody. Listen to what I'm about to say then. And we get to it. The most quoted scripture of all time. Has anybody ever played the telephone game before? Anybody ever played telephone? Tanya, the kids just played telephone the other week, right? What was the initial message? Tanya told the kids in kids ministry, she said she will give them $1 million dollars to the kid at the end, if they can get the original message that she gave the first person in the line in Kids Church. What was the first message? I love fall because it's so pretty outside. And how many kids played this game? Like 20? Okay. And by the end of it, at the end of the telephone game, what was the final statement? It was our daughter, right? That was at the end. What did Ireland tell you at the end of the telephone game? I love bunnies because of Easter. I love bunnies because of Easter. I love fall because it's so beautiful outside. And within 20 people, it became, I love bunnies because of Easter. Can I just, can I just say, humanity has played the telephone game with faith. We have played the telephone game. Well, they said it's like this, and then she said it like this, and then that church said it like that, and that pastor said it was like that, and that church said it was okay, and that one said it wasn't. And we played the telephone game, and we're so confused. And Jesus says, don't look anywhere else other than the example of my life. I'm about to set the record straight, is what he's saying. John 3.16 isn't a beautiful scripture just because it's full of love. It's a strong statement. Jesus is saying, enough of the telephone game. I'm about to tell you what I'm about and what I've always been about. Here's what it is. And Jesus says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, me, I'm here because he loves you, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God's not mad at the world. <laughs> Listen, the things you block and the people you want friend and the people you keep your kids away from and the things you guard, those are all fine things to build principles of morality when you're home. But Jesus loves those people. 
God loves them with a passion and a zeal. And he's frustrated that there's a wall in between them. So Jesus comes down to earth to fix it. For God's, God loves the world, Nicodemus. Jesus said that Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside, but rotting corpses on the inside. Church, you're beautiful, but do you love the world? Do you stop at nothing to get as many people into this family as you can? What are you willing to walk away from? What are you willing to do? I left heaven. I left the throne to get down here to cut the cord to the telephone game. I'm setting the record straight right now. I love the world. I love the people in Ebor at night. I love the people downtown. I love the people that post negative things on Imagine Church's posts. I love the people that hate the church. I love them. I love them. I love every one of them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus came on an order from heaven. Jesus didn't just come just to come. It was an order from heaven for him to come so that whoever believes in him should not perish. Whoever. I want to give you the Greek definition of the word whoever. That means whoever. It means everybody. That person with that belief, you have that person with that belief. The person born into a family, that grew, the person that hates me, the person that, the person that bashes God on every post, the person who, who promotes this or that or the other, the person that's so, yeah, them too. That whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish. Other side of it, please read. But if you believe in him, you won't perish. It says that, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Can I just say this as a pastor? Stop condemning the world. Stop. They don't care about your personal opinion on what they're doing wrong. Be like Jesus. Walk in power. Walk in authority. Walk in grace. People will not come by fear or you proving them wrong. They will come because of the way you live your life. Not the way you judge the way they live theirs. He says... I haven't come to condemn the world. I love the world. Man, if they weren't drunk, I'd be partying with them. You know what I mean? Like, if they weren't about that life, I'd be with them right now, but they're about that life. So I can't do that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have dinner with them at their house. I'm going to invite them over to mine. I'm going to love on them. I'm going to take them out to lunch and I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to come down from heaven and then I'm going to die for them. The world doesn't need you to condemn them anymore. Jesus is going, okay, telephone game. <laughs> Modern Christianity, if people are sinful, let them know they are sinful. Wrong, 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 wrong. That is not what Jesus said to do. Jesus said to be the light, to be a city set on a hill, to have a bright light. He says they will know you by your love for one another. Not they will know you because you make sure they know that you disagree. No, they won't know what you believe because you prove them wrong over and over again. Jesus sets the record straight. I love, I love the world. Verse 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And to risk stepping on toes, I'm going to say this because we say everything in truth and grace that it would be, it would be, it would be unloving to not speak truth. It would be unloving to not speak truth. So give me grace, give me mercy, understand the context, I love you with all my heart. Jesus is not one of the options. Jesus is not one of the options to get to eternal life. Jesus is not one of the popular choices that if you subscribe to this, that, that it's all going to lead you to this destination, okay? He is not, he's making a statement. You can say that he's one of the options, but Jesus did not say he's one of the options. Jesus is saying, I am the only option. There is no other option. It's me and me alone. And if you believe in me, you will not be condemned. But if you don't believe in me, 
The definition of me is me. It's him. It's Jesus. If you don't believe in me, then you're already condemned. What is the condemnation we're talking about? It's the separation from God and humanity. The Bible says you can, you can either serve the enemy or you can serve God. There is no other option. The world has created beautiful options. And one of the lies of the enemy is to get you almost to God. It's the lie of our generation that there's an almost to God. And if you just believe this kind of thinking that you're close enough, no, you're not. The universe cannot save you. The universe cannot save you. There is no statue that can save you. There is no level of higher thinking that can save you. That's not my theology. That's, that's Jesus' theology. He says, anyone who doesn't believe is condemned already because he has not believed in who? The name of the only, come on, the only Son of God. He's not one of the options. He's the only option. You can take John 3.16 and just be done with it and it's gone and miss all of the imperative things that Jesus is saying because so many people take the scripture and go, oh, God still loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him. Well, my believing him is this kind of believing in him. Well, my believing in him is this kind of believing in him. And you miss all the other parts where it's not just you can have a different version of him. Jesus is the actual only way. And in verse 19, and we're done, it says, and, and this is the judgment. The light has came into the world, and people have loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen, and his works have been carried out of God. And I'm going to read it in the message just again to make it more palatable for you. It says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Oh, I skipped on that. I went back to the other verse. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world. I was rereading the ESV. My apologies. But men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the work that he is, that it is. This is why I say all the time, this walk with Jesus is a journey. <laughs> I remember, baby, remember when we had, just we weren't pregnant, like let's go back two years, let's go back nine months. And like my mom would be like, when y'all having another kid? When y'all having another kid? When y'all having another kid? And we'd be like, we're never having another kid. Get behind me, Satan. We're never. There are phases in life when what you would hang your hat on will no longer be what you hang your hat on six months later. This is what Jesus is saying. You're going to have beliefs that you think are just absolute. It is never going to change. The stages of your life will not always remain the same. And what is absolute to you changes based on how you feel in a moment. It changes. It changes based on how you feel. And, and right now, there are many people that I couldn't give this message to because they're not in the stage of life to receive it. And so it's not truth to them right now. But six months from now, it may very well be truth to them. Jesus is simply saying, whether or not you feel like it's truth, it's always truth. It will always be the truth. It can never not be the truth. So get your phases of life figured out. Because he says it's only when you get real and honest about what you really are and what you really feel and what you're really searching for that you will find me. Your stages of life will change. We were never going to have three kids. Now, like, come on, where are my people that don't have babies yet? The people are like, when y'all have the kids, you're like, stop it. We never want them. And then how many, come on, uh, well, I just throw out, for example, when we met Ned and Christina, we're not having kids anytime soon. Not happening. Six months later, they're super pregnant. 
And now they're like, oh my god, baby fever. We're just buying furniture and like oh, to download a Disney Plus, even though we're not Disney people. Like, it's amazing. It's amazing how your stages of life progress. When they got to the real truth that maybe it was something in life that made them feel like they never wanted children, but in fact they really do want children. And I'm just using that as a blanket example. Your stages are your stages. But if you live and die by the stages that was truth to you in this moment, you can do that with everything other than God. You just can't do it with him because he says I'm the only way. And there are many people who aren't ready to hear that message, but I'll say this, if you're in the room, you're ready to hear that message. Because God is not into just doing things. He sets things up. He's playing chess when the enemy plays checkers. And you needed to hear this message today that he's the only way. John 3.16 isn't just a beautiful, oh my God, God loves the world. There were a lot of harsh things that he said before and after that that are very hard to digest. If you just take John 3.16, God is just all about grace and mercy. And if you just love him, I love Jesus and Buddha. That doesn't work. You can't put your faith in anything else other than him. Yeah, but what if that's the way? Well, if you trust Jesus and he says, let my life be an example. Nope. There is nobody who has ever lived that did the things that he did. Nobody who has ever drawn breath has accomplished what he accomplished on earth. Nobody. There has never been a more powerful person to walk the face of the planet and then to get up after three days dead. This is why he has the credibility to make the statement, I'm the only way. If you want life, you've got to serve the one that death couldn't be. Every other God is dead and in a grave. Jesus got up. That's why he's saying, I love the world. I love them so much. I'm coming down here to do this. And, 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 and Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. I, I, I'm trying to give you all of this information so that when I get out of here, when I dip out and I go back to heaven, and I get, I'm thinking this, this all you can eat snow crab legs all the time because we overcharge on earth. I think that, that there's, there's this beautiful place in heaven where God is seated and he leaves to come here and go, let's set the record straight. I love the world. Stop condemning them, but tell them I'm the only way. You can't love them by telling them what they're doing is right now. I'm not saying go get in their face and tell them they're wrong. What I'm saying is go live your life and truth and grace and love and full of the power of God. It's the born again life. Man, I always end up preaching too hard. I always want to end really chirpy like a lot of pastors. <sighs> Take those nuggets home and Enjoy that good teaching. You always look at me sad. Like, oh, my wife's like, looking at me right now. I'm sorry, babe. I just want to give you truth. I want you to walk out of this series. If you walk away from Imagine Church, it's because you saw Jesus clearly and you couldn't accept what he said. But I only want it to be because of that and not because I faked a version of him because it fit my narrative better. When God told us to plant this church, I was looking for some deep revelation. Lord, give me a vision statement, and it's got a rhyme. <laughs> give me the coolest name of all time. I think we do kind of have those things, but it's, the word imagine and extraordinary are trending everywhere right now. If you haven't noticed, those are like the top trending words right now. I see it everywhere and on everything. It's crazy. I thought of it first. But the only thing that really God gave me you get up and you preach truth and whether they like you or they hate you or they never come back, you just give them my truth. Don't ever give them a golden calf. You preach truth. And be loving because you're a teddy bear. Be loving. But give them truth. They'll follow you if you give them a golden calf, but they will follow you to hell. And ain't nobody following me there. I know where I'm going. And I want to help you get there. So I'm not going to give you golden calves on any Sunday. This is the truth of the gospel. John 3 is the truth of the gospel. There is no other way, ladies and gentlemen. And you must be born again. You must be born by the Spirit. So I want to invite you in this moment. And maybe, maybe even in this moment, man, I've been a follower of Jesus. And I've, I've, been, I've been in love with his teachings. But man, I've never had like a like a born-again experience. 
I've never actually asked for the spirit to be born within me, to come within me, for me to be born again. Maybe this is the moment for you. And again, I don't want it to be because, oh, I heard it from Shad. There is no hearsay. This is from Jesus. There is no hearsay. This is the experience of Jesus talking to Nicodemus in the middle of the night. So in your seat, wherever you are, wherever you're at in your walk and your journey, I just want to invite you to think about where you're at with God. Where you're really at. Not where you, like when we take the disc test, I tell everybody, don't answer perfect version answers, okay? That's not who you really are. Give me truth about where you're really at. Are you really born again? Have you really subscribed to that? The Spirit of God is the path to the Father in heaven. I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer with that because I think your journey is your journey and I'm okay with you being in your process and being in your journey. Everybody is welcome to sit at the table. We're just going to feed you from our menu. You know what I mean? Come to my house and have dinner, but I'm going to cook you what I need to cook you based off of what's in my refrigerator. This is what's in my refrigerator, the Bible. So every head down and every eye closed. Lord, I just, right now, maybe you're in the room and you say, Pastor Shad, you know, that was some heavy truth today. Of some heavy truth, but maybe I'm not born again. Maybe I haven't really subscribed to that kind of rebirth. Maybe I haven't subscribed to that sort of thinking. Jesus has been one of my options for how I can be well and live well, but he's not been the only option. He's never been the only option. And today I need to make him the only option. I need to sell out. I need to be filled with the spirit. I need to have the spirit of God rebirth me and created me this new thing that God wants me to be. If that's you, hey man, I've been there. I was there, and I've wrestled with it. I've been Nicodemus even along my faith journey after I was born again. Oh, was that real? Was it? Was it? Was it? And God has continued to show up and show off in my life. So what I want to say, if that's you and you want to start that journey, we can begin that process with you. And every Sunday that you come back, the process grows and it develops and your faith and your belief begins to swell and grow and becomes greater and greater and greater. But that's you today, and you want to start that journey, or maybe you've been on this journey, but you're not so sure you knew what you were getting yourself into. And now that you've had the knowledge, you're ready to take it from information to transformation. If that's you, if you wouldn't mind, just slip up your hand right where you're at. It's just so I can know that that's you. I see the hands. I see them. Come on, I see them. You can put them down. Lord, right now, Lord, I just release... I just release your blessing. I release your revelation over those lives, those hands that went up. Lord, I pray right now that they would see you clearly, Jesus, just you, not a golden calf, not a better thinking, that it would be Jesus and Jesus alone. Lord, I pray that even tonight you would just come speak to them when they lay their head down on their pillow tonight, when they're finally in a moment of silence, they would have a moment with you and just you. Lord, would you fill them to overflow? Lord, I pray that you release the presence of the Holy Spirit into their life. If that's you and you said that prayer, I just want you to posture your heart in a position to receive in this moment. Just posture your heart. Lord, I receive. Just posture your heart. Say, I receive. Lord, I just speak the Spirit of heaven over them, the Spirit of God the Father over them right now. The Holy Spirit be released into their life. Allow them to be born again. Lord, would you change them from the inside out? Would you make them a new creation? Lord, would you make in them a new creation? Would you birth something special inside of them? Lord, would they have eyes for you and you alone? They know where their help comes from. Come on, they know. They don't have to look around. They know where their help comes from, and it's not coming from any other source. It's coming from God and God alone. He is the source of their supply. He's their deep well. Their cup runneth over because he knows them. They are children of his family. Lord, I just release that over their life. Here's what we want to do. In this space, we want to, if you're, if you're going to join us in the next steps, we want to invite you to do that. But if maybe you're just, maybe you've been born again, but you're just in a moment of contemplation right now, I'd love to invite you to come worship with us. We have prayer, my prayer team up here. If you need prayer, they love to pray with you. But I would love to invite you just in response to the word today, in response to what God has said. And Lord, I pray it was all of you and none of me. Humble me 
rebuke me if it was not me. If it was me, rebuke me, Lord. All of you, if you need to respond to that and just maybe make a redeclaration and come forward and just and worship God. I just want to give you freedom. Our worship team's going to keep playing and they're going to they're going to play another song. We want to invite you to worship. Prayer team is up here. I'll be over at Next Steps. If you're coming over for 201, I'd love to see you over there and start your journey with you. But if that's not you, I'm just going to say a prayer. I'm going to walk off and I'm going to let the band continue and we can worship God and continue to worship. Lord, I just, I bless your people. Lord, I pray that that in this next few moments that they would see you and they would know you. Lord, I pray, Lord, favor on their lives. Lord, I pray as they go into their workplace this week that you would bless them. Lord, I pray that they would go in loving the world, inviting people to church, bringing people with them with enthusiasm because God is doing something great. And they want the family to grow. Lord, we love you. Lord, I bless them. I speak favor over their lives. I speak anointing over their lives. Lord, I pray that their cup overflows. I pray that they're blessed in everything that they do, that everything their hand touches would prosper this week. I bless them, the mighty favor of God over their lives. They are blessed going in and they are blessed coming out. Everything they do, they do bless. I love you. We thank you. When it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to invite you.